Tanuka from Stony Brook. And he's going to be talking about the algebra of Poincare duality and statistics from a Right. Thank you. Uh, I tore them out of the book, though. They, they didn't come out very well. So there might be some gaps. <laughs> there are going to be gaps, don't worry. Uh, okay, so the main ideas in this are neither uh, dynamics or partial differential equations. They're ideas from algebraic topology. So let me first state a fact uh, from algebraic topology. There are these things called homotopy groups. You can attach to a space. For each I, the components of the space of maps of the I sphere into the space. Okay. The space is simply connected, and this has a natural abelian group structure. And they're interesting because, for example, the set of differentiable structures on manifolds, Congress manifolds, this is sort of a finite uh, group. Uh, and uh, they can, computing that is sort of tantamount to computing these uh, homotopy groups. Yeah. Now, for no simply connected closed manifold, are the homotopy groups known? The infinite sequence of abelian groups, none of them, and they're not known, but they carry interesting information. Now, if you have two manifolds, x1 and x2, both simply connected, and you have a map between them, but there is something you can compute. You can break the manifold up into little cubes to find a chain complex and compute the homology. And the first category and functor really in mathematics was the so-called induced transformation. If you have a map between two spaces, you can get an induced transformation between some groups called the homology groups. They're computed from this decomposition cell. And this is something you can compute. And if this map induces an isomorphism on these homology groups that you can compute, you know it induces, it follows the theorem, not completely trivial to prove, it's a little bit of content, that it induces an isomorphism on these homotopy groups that you can't compute. So you think that there's some deep information inside the space, inside the manifold, that you can detect it from a rather crude test that you make, but you have to have a map. So it's crucial to have the map, but then deep information is available to you. That's the spirit of this example. Any questions? I need one question to show that I've communicated. <laughs> Except not from Peter, though, because he knows. <laughs> okay, so, well, so this idea, though, that, I mean, this, this fact leads to a kind of uh, category. I mean, you sort of, uh, you think of this, this map now as an isomorphism. And it turns out if you deform the map continuously, this picture doesn't change. And a very interesting category emerged around uh, the 30s called the homotopy category. Uh, it has interesting properties and it carries information. And as I say, it contains sort of deep information. And its properties are kind of a mathematician's mathematician's, a sort of a mathematician's but mathematics. I mean, it's sort of, you can use it as a tool. So that's uh, put into algebra, that tool is going to be the main tool I'm going to use today. Okay, so now let me um, leave that off now. State the fact. Okay, now I'm going to write the obvious stuff. equation models uh, incompressible fluid motion, and I'm going to be interested in mostly three dimensions. And the fluid motion, it's 
is specified at any moment by giving the instantaneous velocity of every fluid particle at every point. And I'm going to worry about, consider uh, the case where the volume is in in incompressible so that a little chunk of fluid moves along, it changes its shape, but it doesn't change its volume. And you, using a Ramanian metric, you have to have a Ramanian metric to write this equation. I'm, and I'm really going to think of uh, a piece of three space, like a cube, made periodic in three directions, ultimately, but just to be concrete. And, uh, and you can write this equation out, and it's important to do it for me now. You can write it out with the language of vector calculus uh, using divergence, curl, pr vector product, the vector of the vectors of three space, that's often the way it's written, a gradient, a divergent curl gradient and vector product. But I want to write it out in the language of, of algebraic topology using differential forms. So differential forms, things that locally either your function or a function times a symbol dx or dx times dy or dx times dy times dz, real coordinates. And you can put these symbols together and they're called graded commutative, and dx dy is minus dy dx, stuff like that. And there's a differential where you differentiate a function, you get the sum of the partials times f sub x dx plus f sub y dy plus f sub z dz, and that's an operator, it's square of zero. And then there's another operator called star, where you dx, star of dx is dy dz, and the star of dy dz is dx sort of perpendicularity and, and when you put the symbols together that's called the wedge product, the Grassmann algebra. And uh, it had, it's a rather beautiful algebraic structure. It's graded commutative differential algebra. And it computes the cohomology, this thing we were just using. I said homology, the dual object called cohomology. Uh, so if we write the, uh, the Nari-Stokes equation, I'm just going to write it out. So it's going to be x is a vector field, but I'm thinking of using the metric as a one form. So instead of writing d by dx and sums of things like that, I'm going to write dx. So, and so the time derivative of this is star of x, which star dx. Here I've used that exterior differentiation. Here's the star, here's the wedge product. So this is a one form, this is a two form, this is a one form, one form, this is a two form, and this is a one form again. Yeah. And here's the metric you're using is the Euclidean at the standard. Yeah, I'm using the cube. Well, I want to write it invariantly. And then there's a funny thing here, EP, I'll explain that in a moment. And then there's a friction coefficient nu times the Laplacian event. So just, now, <clears throat> and then the uh, volume preserving condition is uh, take star of, of x and then take d of it. This is a one form, this is a two form, this is a three form, so that some function times the volume. This is the divergence essentially. So that's the Incompressibility. So there's the Navier Stokes equation. Uh, now, uh, here's the epistemological situation. As I mentioned, two, it turns out you can prove that for smooth initial conditions, uh, so you want to, and then sort of, x of t equals zero is some x naught. So you can well. So you can prove in dimension two that we start with any initial condition. In fact, quite precise regularity, uh, and then you have existence and uniqueness for all time with this point. In fact, it's even true if you set this viscosity term equal to zero. This is called the Euler equation, and that is still true then. However, even in dimension two, uh, it's hard to compute the solution. My understanding is hard to compute the solution. Luis, do you have anything? 
about that? It's a two-dimensional fluid motion. You mean numerically? What? Do you mean numerically? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's almost indistinguishable from a world. It's almost what? Almost indistinguishable from a problem that's no well posed. Ah. Not distinguishable from a problem that's not well posed. Is that what you say? Yeah, like that. The, the, the thing remains smooth, but you cannot tell me. Yeah, right. That, that's my understanding. What's the, D, D, the D -row, what? What's the D row term? Is that? Oh, just you give some an initial condition. You have your fluid is like this with a certain vector field, and it starts to move. Oh, what's this, D -row, yeah. this thing here? Yeah. I'm going to say that. Okay. Uh, anyway, the reason it's difficult, I'll, I'll say what this is. This just is, is, is put in to make this constraint hold. This, the reason it's difficult is because this is a quadratic in x. This is the nonlinear term. These two terms, well, this is part of the nonlinear term, too. But this is what makes the thing hard. And then in dimension three, uh, it's not known whether this has initial, this has um, uh, solutions with smooth data. And, and what we're going to do in a minute, we're going to see that the, the, uh, a certain norm, the energy norm, is non, not increased, and the, I want to actually go through that computation because I want to see what properties of these algebraic operations are required to give that proof. And then uh, it turns out that that thing that you can control is not enough to make this object well-defined. So the, if you put in a norm that makes, if you work in a space where these op this operation is well-defined, that norm which is stronger than the energy norm, might just blow up at finite time and the equation becomes ill-defined. So one doesn't know whether that happens or not. And how do we know this is the right model for actual? We don't. Although it seems to work very well in a large variety of situations. I mean, engineers use it and, uh, all over the world. And that's what astonished me, because when I heard about this problem, I heard about this in the early 90s, and uh, 92, and uh, I didn't know it was unsolved in dimension three. And uh, I wanted to find out why it's unsolved. I, was, I know these really smart analysts like John Bergay and Charles Redmond. I think they secretly work on this, but, uh, but and I was about to mention something. So <clears throat> in the presence of this term here, this is like the heat equation, the heat operator. X dot is epoxy and X in the right sign. This smooths the data, it sort of averages it, it, smooths it. So this is helping you. This is your enemy. And uh, it's known now, I think it's due to John Bergay, maybe Larry Taylor, I'm not sure, Michael Taylor, uh, that if you knew the L3 norm, the, the, I'm going to talk about the, the, the L2 norm, but if you knew the stronger norm, the L3 norm, if you had some oracle telling you that's not going to blow up, that's enough keep this thing under control. The smoothing here is enough to make this term be well defined. You can think you do a little of this and this, 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 this. So, <coughs> um, but there's a gap between what you know and what you need, a definite gap. Okay, so that gap has not been uh, changed much since the 30s when the array worked on this and set up so what we have call solar space theory called that and some of the basic techniques of PDE. Um, okay, I didn't want to spend a lot of time on this, so so you can find out pretty fast why the uh, great geniuses haven't solved this analysis. It's really there's, there's just missing information. It's like missing. Okay, so. To write this, get up every morning and write this equation. I could write it anyway, and so on. But try algebra. So, well, actually, the, the two-dimensional equation uh, turned out to be equivalent to uh, something we studied in, in uh, Riemann surface theory called the Beltrami equation. So, the Beltrami equation is exactly equivalent mathematically, not isomorphic mathematically equivalent to the two-dimensional equation without, even without this, uh, without this term. And, and uh, 
you know it, I'm talking to an expert in the field, Howie, but you know that when all fours or when all fours set up the tight motor theory, and you solve the equation by finding a flow that moves the standard conformal structure to any other conformal structure. That's the equation, it's the equivalence of the two dimensions of the equation. You get this, you you have data on half of the derivative of a vector field and you do the transform that produces the other half and the data is bounded. This transform takes you into this space called BMO and the vector field then turns out satisfies a modulus of continuity T log T. If it satisfies, or in other words, it's not Lipschitz, if it was just a T, that's what we mean by Lipschitz. The fundamental theorem of ODEs uh, proved by Picard's method requires Lipschitz continuity and there's a convergent method that works. So that logarithm there destroys the Picard method. And in the Beltrami case, because of complex variables, there's a Neumann series that you can write down that gives a way to compute it. But apparently there's not one. I don't know. Actually, I don't know. I, mean, I don't know exactly how hard it is to compute in dimension two or why what the story is. But people, I know people are computing and speculating about what they get. You know, like when you pour a little, you're boiling water or something, when you make artichokes or something, and you put a little oil in, you see all these drops of oil and they sort of come together and coalesce. There's some coalescing of the twisting and, and, and the, the twisting aspect of the fluid in dimension two, which seems to be what the computations reveal. reveal. But, okay. Anyway, uh, well that's like the problem. So, so I want to dedicate this lecture to Cyprian Foyas. He was a uh, one of your colleagues, Peter Constantine, a former colleague, and he worked a lot together. And I remember when I first started asking people about this in the early 90s, he's he was so very excited about this, and he, he said, he's talking about what is the structure of the nonlinear term? What's the structure of the nonlinear term? Right, so that's the that's, oh wow, this is the concept of the structure of the nonlinear term. So I wanted to find out what the structure of the nonlinear term is. Okay, so what's the that's what this talk is about. What's the structure of the nonlinear term? Whatever that means. Okay. Now let me state the goal. So uh, uh, because even in dimension two, when you know if you have existence and uniqueness, it's still hard to compute. Uh, so you don't know when uh, the hurricane out in the Gulf of Mexico is coming in, this spiraling thing, where it's going to hit the coast. You can't predict it very accurately. You'd like to just be able to, you know, they have a few, they have certain data about certain velocities and where things are and so on. You'd like to have, out of approximate data, get approximate information about the, about the future, right? That's what all modeling is about. So actually, it's sort of interesting here. You, relax. you don't have to prove any theorems here. Uh, all you have to do is, uh, I mean, if you want to do something with this, you want to make models that can be computed and seem to fit with data. Okay, you want, you want to have something useful. So that's that's sort of my goal, not to prove anything. It's very relaxing not to have to prove anything. Don't listen, grad students. Huh? Tell the grad students to not listen to that. <laughs> okay. So, so here's the, so this is a this is like an ODE in an infinite dimensional space. You know, you have the vector field, and just that the right hand side is not continuous in, in any topology that you can work with. And, uh, so the goal is I sort of I'll sort of say it like this. model this model. I want to find a, a bunch of finite dimensional ODEs like this with precise mappings between them. So I'll have a small number of degrees of freedom I'm measuring here, more here, more here, and more here. And then I want to have an actual ODE and this these are all finite dimensional. 
etc. And then I want to have precise, this is like I described this at the abstract, precise what we call semi conjugacies namely, if, let me draw the, draw the picture here, so there's going to be some ODE and some finite dimensional manifold, and then this map should be like a vibration, and then if you take a vector here and you look, lift it over every fiber, every one of these vectors up here projects exactly to this vector. So I want to have a tower of models with these maps between them. Now, it's very easy to get a tower of models that are finite dimensional, what they're called the Lurkin approximations. You just take the Hilbert space and you just project the vector field into various finite dimensions. It will have lots of nice properties, but you won't have these arrows. So the whole point of the talk is to have these arrows. I have these arrows. And then I, I want this finite dimensional thing to be defined for all time. So I need just that it's finite dimensional, and then I need some to know it's line is the action is taking place in a compact part of some manifold. You know, that it's a manifold. Okay, so that's the goal. Now, what can you do with the goal? Sorry, is your, is your energy what? is your energy function? You said before that the energy does not blow up here, but that wasn't enough to control it. Is, do you have the energy? Yeah, I'm going to use the energy from up there. In finite dimensions, any energy is good. Okay, and these are all proper downstairs? Energy? Uh, well, it's, I don't have to answer that question. Okay. <laughs> because I said I wanted to have these all be uh, compact. I want to have a region, compact with regions. There might, these might be sitting in a space which isn't a proper map, like the vector spaces. So, okay. Now what can you do with this? Well, there's a book by uh, Foyas and Const Constantine and Foyas called Napier Stokes Equation. You look at the last few chapters of that book. After they develop the, what they know about this equation, they, they're sort of studying uh, trajectories where you assume you have a smooth solution and perturbations of those trajectories. And what they find is that volume elements, so let me just pretend it was finite dimensional because I would be in these models. Volume elements are decreased uh, exponentially fast, and all the trajectories go to some attractor which has lower dimension. And so you would expect there to be in nice measures on this attractor. Well, in, we know abstractly that there are measures, but when you have something like this, you expect that the smooth measure actually compresses down to some measure on the attractor. And then you can take these different measures this, any measure you have here that's invariant on this one will project to an invariant measure here because of this coherence. And so you get this tower of invariant measures. So this Kolmogorov theorem says there's kind of a measure up at infinity. And that's the statistics of Nagyar Stokes that's in the title. So if you get this tower, I mean, this precise statement I said about attractors is just like combining, you know, you can start dealing with this system as a, as a, as a dynamicist in finite dimensions and see what you can do. And then you can move up the tower, and, and uh, you can think of these as like finite marginals. So if you want to know some statistical structure, but you know finite amounts of information at these stages. So, so, this, so that's the goal. This measure that you're talking about is not to be confused with a measure that the compressibility measure. No. no. This is like a measure on the dynamical this is, space. This is on the dynamical space, yeah. See, right now there's no measure on the space of initial conditions. There's no statistics for Dr. Stokes because it's an infinite dimensional space. You can't do this. So the, the whole point of getting finite dimensions is that now suddenly you have the vague measure and you can now compress it and study it dynamically. That's what happens, right? So you get some, and then you get by Kolmogorov or his inverse limit construction, you get statistics at infinity. So if you can find this tower, you get some statistics. Uh, so and now, now these models, Here's the part, which is, these should be, well, and this is the vague thing, they should be derived from the Nagar Stokes. Now, if I don't say what I mean by that, I can't state a precise theorem. I could, it's, I could derive zero from anything. So, but you'll, you'll see that 
I'm really using the equation, so um, okay, I'm not going fast enough. Now, there should also be some geometric idea behind these models, and, and I feel I've, I'm uh, pretty convinced that this is going to be the idea, the geometric idea. Not, not the geometric idea for producing them, but the geometric idea for using them. Maybe you want to prove something. So it's this. So I'm going to. It's hard to draw cubes, so I'm going to right now. I'm going to draw squares. So I'm really thinking of cubes of three space. So it's a geometric idea. Now, <coughs> see, somehow you can't really use. I thought of this thing, I decided not to say it, but I'll say it. The, con the continuum is sort of like a tuxedo, or a beautiful gown for a woman. It looks really great, and it's great in certain circumstances, but it's not, if you're cleaning the garage, a tuxedo is not the right thing to have. And the continuum is what's causing us all the trouble. So we're going to try to get rid of the continuum. The naughty thing to do. So anyway, so and I'll, so that'll be. Even though know, I'm going to use the continuum right now, but now, suppose you uh, see. Uh, I'm imagining I have this flow, and maybe there's a lot of wiggle in the pass. And there's certain things you could do, like I'm in the plane here, so I'm going to let, let x stand for the one form dx and y stand for the one form dy. It's just, so you can integrate x along the path and then break y along any, any little <coughs> path and you get um, you get the change in the x and the y coordinates. Then you could also integrate what's called like an iterated integral of x and then y. You integrate x dx partially along the path. This produces the function little x. You multiply that times y and then you integrate along the path. So that's the integral of x dy, which if this were a closed path, the integral of x dy is the area enclosed, right? So it's up to some normalization is the area. Um, and then you can keep going with these. You can, you can form higher iterated integrals. And it's a nice fact that uh, uh, all of these numbers, if you have a, a smooth path, no matter how wiggly, it determines the geometric path up to the translation. That's one state. So it really gives you a lot of control and so, so I'm sort of thinking that this is like standard calculus. These two things here, because you know, if your path, if you were at a fine scale, or you you know, you were took your grid small enough so that these paths were look smooth and almost straight, then then just knowing the change in x and the change in y more or less tells you the path. You don't need to know this, but if it's wiggly might like to know this, All right? So this is like second, second order terms in calculus. So then you can imagine third order, fourth order, and so on. And now there's many expressions here because if you, you write down x, you can write down any word in x and y, and there's an iterated integral for that. And they're actually like, think of these as coefficients on the tensor algebra, a free tensor algebra generated by x and y. They're not all linearly independent algebraically independent. Uh, but it turns out the independent ones are related to what's called the free Lie algebra generated by x and y. So, so it turns out you can, and, and there's a nice idea here that if you, if you, uh, if you think of the path going in the dual one skeleton. Let's take a pass like this. And this is like x, y, x, y, x inverse, y inverse. So it's like a word in the free group on two generators. And you can take the free group on two generators and you can make it what's called nilpotent. You can kill all the commutators about some order. And that gives you a nice nilpotent group tend to that group with Q or R, and you get a Lie group, pass to its Lie algebra, look at the left invariant forms from that Lie algebra, and they're basically certain expressions of these iterated integrals. 
And so the position of the path in the lead group, in the free group, made no folks a certain order sort of described by this. And then if you, if you uh, go to infinity and like rescale, you get any continuous path this way. There's some interesting discussion of the regularity of the path that is to be defined, but all the paths that occur in this problem will satisfy that regularity. Okay, so now, uh, so what I've just said is there's some, this is an impressionistic idea that there's possibly some, the calculus is based on the idea of the linear approximation is adequate. You know, the derivative tells you what's going on. But I want to have some nonlinear stuff going. So that's why I need these things. It's pretty, pretty vague. Um, okay, so now, oh, so a big thing here now is a uh, big tool are these Lie algebras. So let me let me talk about, and I need a differential. Let me talk about differential Lie algebras for a second. So I can't really spend a lot of time on this, but and eventually they're going to be the underlying Lie algebra is going to be free like this one or truncated to be no fault. So there's not going to be anything fancy going on with the Lie algebra. These are just like polynomials or something. They're just universal objects. What's interesting, the structure though that's interesting is the differential in there. There's going to be an operator of square zero, which is going to be a derivation of the Lie algebra. But at this point I can talk about any differential Lie algebra. And now they should be an important thing is they should be graded. And the grading can be can uh, run, it can be on both sides of, of zero. That allow that. So this is, and the D, you have to choose whether you're a geometer or an algebraist. Algebraists always choose the D to go up one, and I always choose the D to go minus down one. But it's no big deal because you just turn the thing over, something that goes down one will then go up one. No big deal. So, but what's interesting is whether the differential points toward the origin or away from it. That's independent of whether you turn it upside down or not. And the meaning of the differential Lie algebra is, is, is dependent on this. So it turns out this side is sort of like homotopy groups in algebraic topology. And you look at this in mathematics, and this side is, is sort of like deformation theory. I'm in Walter Bailey's office, and there's a book in there, Kodaira's book on deformation of complex manifolds by Kodaira. And, uh, on one page of that book, right? it's theorem 5.1 on page 220 or something like that. He's deforming the complex structure, and he has, uh, knows what a tangent vector of is, and then he, he gets a, a leaf bracket measures the obstruction to finding a quadratic approximation to the deformation of the complex structure. And that's what this deformation theory is. So uh, if your Lie algebra only had stuff pointing away from the origin, uh, then elements here in, degree, in, this, in this degree, there's an interesting equation you can look at, which is du plus minus and a half. And this is Here's an interesting, not dissimilar equation up there. Quadratic equation you can look at. So this equation can be formulated because see, du is here and u times u is here. So two terms are in this degree. Right? So this equation, uh, now there's a remarkable property. Well, a lot of interesting math problems are controlled by solutions of such an equation in the context of differential graded Lie algebras. Um, and let's look at the, so this is a nonlinear equation, so you get a nonlinear solution space. And uh, you, <coughs> so if 
if you consider just a trip, so this is in some space x, so if you just consider translation by some vector v, you wonder if, what does it mean to be tangent to this solution space? And it turns out what it means to be tangent is that if you're just adding a translation and you apply it to a point, you stay to first order on this solution space, then there's, a, there's a, another operator here which we'll call delta sub u. So delta sub u of x is defined to be delta x plus the add, I mean, the bracket of u and x. So this is, um, and then it turns out that something's tangent to here if and only at, at the point x, this, what we call this v, sorry, x and this is v, sorry. So there's two things I want to say about this, that a vector v is tangent at x if and only if this is true, it's the kernel of this operator. And this equation here, I'm at a point u in this equation here. This equation here is tantamount to this being zero. So at each point there's a of the solution of this equation, there's an operator of square zero, and the kernel of the operator is the tangent space. And the image of the operator, um, you want to uh, ignore those. So you look at vectors which are in, that, that are of the form du of some other element a, and you want to identify two points that are related by moving in, in such a direction. So there's sort of a, you might say there's sort of a foliation by the exact tangent vectors, and the leaf space is, we're going to call this mc of this V algebra, say of L. So L is some differential V algebra. So MC of Li L, MC stands for Warrior Carcon. Uh, uh, MC of L, the mod device space associated to this means you look at the solution of this equation and then you um, divide out by motions by, by exact tangent vectors. So if this thing is a manifold, its tangent space will be the kernel, it'll be the whole tangent space, which is the kernel of delta u, divided by the image of delta u. So it will be the first cohomology, kernel mod the image for this delta u. And that'll be the tangent space. And there are criteria for knowing when this thing is a manifold and so on. So it's some kind of non-abelian or non-linear cohomology. See, this is not a linear space anymore. It's something like cohomological. And now there's this remarkable fact, where I'm in the Lombard crew, so the standard nowadays, but I heard this word in the 90s. What so if you have a map, it's like this map between spaces I was talking about before, that induced a nice way of visual homology, then this sort of complicated information that we can't compute is mapped isomorphically, right? Well, the analogous thing here, this is something, you know, you can't, you know, you don't know what this is any more than a monkey. I mean, it's a nonlinear equation. You can't solve such an equation. Every algebraic variety can be written as linear plus quadratic terms in a bunch of variables. Like, no, you don't know this. But, and then you don't know this equivalence relation either. But anyway, you can define it. And the theorem is that if you have a map between two differential Lie algebras, the exact map, then if it induces an isomorphism on the ordinary homology defined by this operator, it's a differential Lie algebra, so I'm supposing. Sorry, the homology of the Lie algebra? Of the Lie algebra, yeah. And the coefficients? Are, everything's overall. Oh, okay. Thinking that way, anyway. Before you said non abelian. But I'm thinking it's, uh, I meant to say non linear. Okay. But abelian is like linear. Anyway, if a map induces a nice, if a map between the uh, induces a nice work of homology, then it, indu it induces a bijection. Did I put 
things. I put things here because I have this equivalent relation between the moduli spaces. This is a bijection. So, now, when I first heard this, I stood up because, hey, this means homotopy theory can be applied to um, these subtle problems like this. I first heard this from this age. In the early 90s. Everybody who works in deformation theory probably knows it. But. So that means we, you know, we can start using these tools that we understand and, and, and for certain nonlinear equations. I mean, you're talking about three groups before. Hmm? You're talking about three groups before. Isn't this like Stalin's theorem and three groups? Three no, it's like that. It's like Stalin's theorem. Well, not even, no, no, not exactly. Uh, Stalling's theorem is the analog of if I had um, another one down here in a map like this and induced an isomorphism on the, the Belianized thing, then it's an isomorphism everywhere, which is a little bit like the first thing. Actually, it's more like the first thing, I would say. Now I want to start talking about the, uh, so the, I'm trying to motivate why you would uh, work with such arcane objects. Um, so now we want to start taking this, uh, we want to see what the structure of this nonlinear term is. And in an answer to Danny's question about proper and so on, We want to worry about, we're going to need some energy at the end because we're not automatically going to have a compact space to work on. Even though it's finite dimensional, we need some energy to keep it in a compact region. So, so let's look at the proofs, the standard proof. Probably, I don't know if Lorraine certainly made this computation in the 30s. I don't know if he was the first one. Let's just make the computation. Let's compute. So, apologize to the PDE people up here, but we're going to analyze the computation a little bit. So, uh, so this is differential forms on a manifold, Ramanian manifold, and you have this L2 norm. This is the L2 norm. That's the inner product, the infill of the manifold. This is the tree torus. And then there's something else. If you drop the star, if you just look at this pairing here, this is what I want to call prime rate duality. This doesn't use the metric. It sets up a duality between k forms and n minus k forms. It's called prime rate duality. Now, um, so let's see. So we compute. So let's compute the energy, the L2 norm, which is. That's equal to xx to the integral of x wave star x. Okay, let's take the time derivative. This is time derivative. This is 2. Well, this is every time you differentiate, you use the product rule. Okay, Now, 
I use the associative law, the wedge product, two things here, three things. Star squared is one, associative law for wedge, and graded commutative. So let's put this one in. Now, actually it doesn't matter what this term is. I'll, I'll tell you what the term is though. Uh, this is means volume preserving vector field. Every vector field is uniquely, canonically, the direct sum of a volume-preserving vector field and a gradient. So this general vector field is the sum of a volume-preserving and a gradient. This is the gradient piece. So when you subtract it off, minus, this produces something volume-preserving. So that's the meaning of that term. So it doesn't matter what this is. This computation doesn't matter because we're going to have integral of x wedge star, well, let me just put the star here, p. Now, in relative to Poincaré duality, the exterior d operator is self-adjoint. You can just d of x, y is dx of y plus x dy. The integral of d of something is zero, so putting it on the other, it's actually minus. So then this is equal to the integral of d star x wedge p, but this is zero. So here we use d as self-adjoint, plus or minus self-adjoint, and we use that as incompressible. And then here, this is equal to minus nu times the integral. Now this thing is d star d plus d d star where d star is star d star, it's the adjoint with respect to the metric. So if we put that in, this is star d star, this is star d star. Right? So if we put that into x, this part here will kill the x because of the incompressibility. So I just left with this one term, minus nu x wedge star x star dx. And I can put this star over here because that was symmetric. And I self adjoin, I put this over here. rotates the space and deforms its shape, keeping the volume preserved. And the amount of rotation is the twisting. And so it's sort of giving friction, and you're losing energy by the twisting. So that's, that's what this sort of 
cube calculation shows. Okay, so if we want to have this calculation, we need all of these properties. Star squared is one, d is self-adjoint. We need the basic integrals of algebraic topology, you know, the Stokes theorem, stuff like that. Uh, d is self-adjoint, integrals of algebraic topology, and wedge is a uh, commutative associated gradient of algebraic topology. So let's start. So the idea now, the idea of the models is to just, let's just despertize all this stuff. Because, you know, algebraic topology is already halfway there. I mean, uh, for example, just take, think of your space. I mean, I'm drawing squares again, but I really think of cubes and three space. Break your space up into lots of little cubes and draw squares. And then, you integrate your, you take your differential forms where this equation is happening and you integrate them over like a, a two form, you integrate over each face of every cube. And you get a two coat chain. And by Stokes theorem, the D operator commutes with the co-boundary operator of the algebraic topology. So we have this linear math uh, voice down like that. And you would sort of imagine the star operator is related to dual. And so we're almost there, and then we have the integral is just evaluating the fundamental class on our co-chain. That's the integral. We have all that. But what about the wedge? So the history of algebraic topology is largely associated to this discussion of the discrete analog in algebraic topology of this wedge, which is like cup product, and all the derived ideas related to cup product. But we call it cup product. So there is a cup product that goes with the wedge. And you can have it be associative, but you can't have it be commutative. And uh, there's actual structures to this in finite <laughs> characteristics discussions. Well, then, you back but, up for a second. You say we're almost there, meaning well, we no, well, no, we're almost there. What, what, what I want to do is move this language down to a finite model. And then just write the equation again in the finite model. And then, for example, you want this calculation to work. And I want this calculation to work, okay. right? So, so if I just what do you need for if I just work, do literally. what I learned as a Princeton graduate student, I, I'm yes. missing one piece. Okay. I didn't have to be associative, not commutative. And maybe well, you got to worry about some of these other things. But anyway, all right. So okay. So we know the requirements. Okay, so, uh, so, so now we're going to... The cup product is combinatorial. You can already... Yeah, it's, you, know, you can write nice formulae for cup product in the cubical decomposition and just make them associative and not commutative. Now, I won't mention the name, but there's well known topologists who did the final. Well, they just, in characteristic zero, I mean, in R, just make it commutative by uh, averaging, and then you're done. But then that destroys associativity. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to make it commutative, and then we're going to destroy associativity, and then try to put back associativity. That's what we're going to do. We're going to put back associativity. So that's where uh, that's this word derived from Navier Stokes. This is used to kind of notion of derived mathematics, where uh, if things are approximately true, you can make them true in some derived setting. So this thing is trying to be associative anyway. Let, let, let me just mention, let, let's think of this, this picture of the product space. So algebraic topology is where you try to define a product if you, if you take the diagonal map and think of one dimensional space across one dimensional space. The diagonal map, you see, is not a cellular map. The vertices go to the vertices. It's, it's cool. But the one cells go out in the middle of the two cells. And so Peter's thesis advisor. Right. Steen Robert, your advisor? No, John Moore. John Moore, okay. Who was his advisor? First by Steen Rod. Whitehead. Whitehead, okay. Oh, you, you take a you kind of perturb the topological diagonal to something which is perturbing the cells, and then you, you take your co-chains and tensor them together and restrict to that. That's your cut product. I'm actually going to use 
it's important that I'm, I'm going to actually use what's called a co-product. I'm going to map the change into the tensor product. That's called a co-product. <coughs> um, well, you can go ahead and make it symmetric and divide by two, but then you destroy associativity. But now if you look at the associator, AB times C minus A times BC, the error is concentrated in here. And this error can be deformed to zero algebraically. It's called the chain homotopy to zero. So, um, and then you can look at higher associativity constraints and uh, you can keep doing that. So anyway, so, we'll, so, so now back to here. Now this, is the, this was the product, so I'm going to erase it. This is about, see already this is sort of hard. If you took the product of this one itself, you'd have a four-dimensional space and the diagonal sitting in the four-dimensional space. There's a lot of geometry there. It's not so trivial. And three, you have six-dimensional space. There's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of stuff there. So anyway, so let's let the, let's use the symbol chains. This means the chains. These are just linear combinations of vertices or edges or faces or solid cubes. So you have a graded thing, four groups. And you have a boundary operator going like this. That's what all this stands for chains. And that's what you use to compute that homology that was relevant in this theorem and analogously in that theorem. Okay, so now, uh, so here's what you can do. There's this weird thing you do is you shift this down by five. So C minus is going to refer to something in two, one, zero, and minus one. Shift it down by one. Take the same groups and shift them down by one. Now these things, if I had this cubical thing, this thing is actually very simple. If you just if you just had one cube and you identified opposite faces, you get a, a rather pretty thing. You get one vertex, all corners of the cube are identified, just by opposite faces. Then you have three edges that look like this. Then you have three faces that wrap around A, B. A inverse, B inverse. There are three of those. You choose A, B, B, C, and A, C. And then you have, and then you have one three-dimensional thing that's glued onto that. And this is a cell decomposition where the boundary operator is zero. You actually do some homology. You have three generators in dimension one, three in dimension three, one in dimension three, and one in dimension zero. That's the point for duality. So there's my little bit of point for problem. And this whole thing here is that call that whole thing H that satisfies the point duality. This whole thing is just translation invariant. If I went n this way and n this way and n this way, I would have Zn cross Zn cross Zn. So linear combinations of those translates, that would give me the whole thing. So I just tensored this H with the group ring on that finite group. That would give me labels for all my cells. A little differential you've got to put in that tensoring. The, the, the differential goes in, in the tensor. But this thing I'm thinking of it is basically just a point rate duality object with some extra parameters here. So I'm thinking of this okay. Now, here's the. This is. Uh, I put the minus, I put it down there. Well, let's form this object. The Friedli algebra on on this thing, but we can think of that as being just uh, the Friedli algebra. I have three guys, in dimension one and three in dimension two, and then you have a lot of copies. And it keeps going in this direct sum here, and then here's what you do: you Oops, you put the boundary operator here. This has degree minus one. And then you extend this operator to a derivation of the whole Friedli algebra using Leibniz rule. Now, this map here is my cup, is my co-product that I got by taking a diagonal approximation and symmetrizing it. And it See, before it was graded symmetric. This cut product is graded symmetric. You know, if you multiply two forms, 
an offset order, you get minus one for PQ coming out, right? But I've shifted down by one, so now this thing that was graded symmetric is now graded skew symmetric. So this is the proper thing to write for graded skew symmetric, or Lee algebra is graded skew symmetric. And then this term here is this homotopy, chain homotopy. Uh, See, this will be, you had these two maps, the associator of dualized, which had degree zero, which didn't, weren't equal. But when you shift it down by one, see, this, uh, when you shift down by one, it's a, it's a map of the three things, the co-associator. It's a map from here to three things. So this goes down by three, and this goes um, down by one. So the difference is, you have two things at the same height, and one goes down by three, one goes down by one. So this has degree minus two. Uh, but then it's a homotopy. So actually, I'm looking at the homotopy, so that has degree plus one more. So minus two plus one is minus one. So this has degree minus one. I should have done the calculation here. This co-product before had degree zero. You shift it down by one, this goes down by two, this goes down by one. Now it has degree minus one. This, 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 this thing always amazes me how this works. And then the next one is going to be a homotopy of a homotopy, but there's going to be four things. And now when you shift it down, you gain an extra one, but the homotopy of homotopy gains another one. So this also has to be minus one. So it turns out, when you keep going like this, I, I can't explain how this is done. And it, it's, um, it, whatever I wanted to do, if it were somehow possibly possible, it would be possible because I'm working locally and there's this idea that when you want to solve equation, the D of something is something else. If you're solving inside a space that has no homology, you can do it. You can also make it canonical. Okay, so then, oops, I should stop. I'm not, let me have a couple more minutes to round off, okay? All right, so then, so this is restoring the associativity, which is the, uh, one of the things I needed. This is how you restore it. And the condition here is that uh, if you call this, now extend this to a derivation, extend this to a derivation. These are the generators, so just apply Leibniz rule. So you get an operator, I'll call it D1, this one's called D1, and this one's called D2. These are all derivations of the Lie algebra. And the condition is that on these maps is that this is zero. So this thing is zero. And so this thing, so if I call this thing D, D is this whole plus sign. And I'm getting a derivation um, which is um, S squared zero of the real. So I get one of these differential real. Now, the, the uh, nonlinear truncation is going to sort of rest on the idea that I can truncate this at any stage I want, put all higher commutators equal to zero, and I'll get a finite dimensional differential graded Lie algebra. So I have this tower of I have this tower of Lie algebras that um, uh, coming in to, uh, I have this tower of Lie algebras of the finite dimensional, but the whole thing is like restoring associativity. So then, so now there's this thing that's due to Ailey Carton. And it's generalized, it's called the Carton Annenberg construction. That Carton is Henri Carton. Anyway, what Ailey Carton did is suppose you had a Lie group. Lie groups, of course, were invented, they were the Galois groups of ODEs, right? Back to ODEs somehow. You have a Lie group, uh, and you study the infinitesimal uh, group structure at the origin, you get the Lie algebra. And Carton wanted to write down the differential forms on this Lie group, which are left invariant. They're all completely determined by what they do at the identity, because they're left invariant. And, and, um, 
So, and so it's just the exterior algebra at the identity on the, on the, on the dual of the tangent space. So you take the symmetric algebra or exterior algebra on the dual of the tangent space. And then the tangent space is the Lie algebra. So it has this map from, it has this bracket map to t, and then dualizing it, and it has the next few symmetries. So dualizing, you can kind of write this like this. Dualizing it, we get a map from t star to t star, wedge t star. Just dualizing this map. And then you're going to call this d. This turns out to, oh, then you do this thing, you shift plus one. So the Lie algebra is sort of sitting in degree zero. So shift it up, make all the dual variables into one forms. One. So shift it up by one, and then take the exterior algebra on that vector space and define d by this the dual of the bracket, and then extend it to be a derivation. And the beautiful thing is the Jacobi identity is equivalent to d squared is zero. And then you can extend this to differential Lie algebra. You just do the same thing, except you throw in the differential as an extra derivation. So then we can do that, and now. So, uh, so what we're going to do is apply this Ailey Carton extended as Henri Fami. So we're going to take this differential Lie algebra here. So this is this is the free. Notice this is the free Lie algebra generated by uh, the chains with all these operators. And then, uh, so then we're going to dualize it. Now this is infinite dimensional, so you might get worried about that, but this for safety, let's just truncate it at every height and dualize that. That makes final dimensional that. So we dualize that and we form the uh, three graded algebra generated, let's say we truncate it at some height. We now lift it up by one. Before we lift it down by one, now we lift it back up by one. And then we put the differential in that comes from the bracket and this differential. And so we get some operator D. This one had degree minus one, so in the dual variables, this has degree plus one. And this is the free grading community algebra. So it has a wedge. By definition, graded commutative. And uh, what we know from sort of abstract homotopy theory is that this construction has the same homological information as the original chains. This is called the, the trade, the double bar construction. So this has this, has this, this is really a, a version. It has the right homology and all. It will still be like the Q torus. Although I forgot to do an augmentation here. So that, that would be false. You have to augment. Uh, well. But, but but if I if I I can follow what I'm doing here by the fact <coughs> by that construction. So what I get is a differential Lie algebra. Yeah, I'm sorry, I got to handle myself. Sorry, I got different graded commutative uh, differential algebra. And, and now let me just go back to here a second. This, this thing here, remember this was this thing H tensor the, the three ZN groups that makes this, moves these cubes around. This satisfies crank rate duality. So there's a result in 2004 uh, by uh, uh, Alistair Hamilton and uh, Lazarus that precisely in this Lie context, when you, the crank rate duality becomes like a, a symplectic structure, a graded symplectic structure at this level. And they can, it's a theorem that the theory of this D with or without the symplectic structure is the same. So you can have this D's respect the Planck array duality. So that's probably a deep point that I'm going to use at this point. And the theory of such things up to homotopy is the same. So I have my Planck array duality. So I'm just not, I'm going to start. This off. So, uh, so roughly speaking, these things here, this 
quite well. These things will be obtained by, well, there's, there's two parameters in the truncation. First, you choose a cell decomposition, and uh, then you have to choose a degree of cutoff for these brackets. And then, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of things that we have to say, but these formulas have been worked out for the unit interval, for example, and they're already quite interesting. If this is E, A, and B, formulas are something like the boundary of E, boundary of A plus one half A, A, zero, same thing for B, and then the boundary of E is an infinite expression, which is uh, the topological term, boundary of a interval is this one is this, and there's one term here, and then there's an infinite series of Newton numbers of the i factorial, and then add e raised to the i power applies to e minus a. And this term here is this other term in that delta u I had up before. And, this is term here. and then if you, uh, now this is real, the real uh, punchline is that when you subdivide the natural chain, chain maps go into the subdivision. Did you hear that? My phone's ringing, right? I'm giving a lecture. Whoever it is, I'll call you back. <laughs> I didn't bring my voice. So, um, if you actually subdivide, you get a map like this, and it turns out that the image of this map is E goes to E1 plus E2, and it's sort of like the Campbell Baker Hausdorff formula. Minus one half E1 bracket E2, and then plus one twelve for the triple bracket and the twelve and so on. And so the so as you subdivide, you have very non-trivial maps between these Lie algebras, and they can all be, in principle, I haven't done it, but they can all in principle be computed on a computer for various grids. Like like this, and uh, then you have this direct system of chains, and when you take the dual space, like I did here, then you get inverse system at this A and Cartan level. So that gives you this tower of differential graded algebras. And now, because of all this, is, all this stuff is homotopically meaning, meaningful, there's, there's a homotopy class of maps in this homotopy category of differential graded objects. Uh, where all the diagrams are commuting up to homotopy, and because the elements are free, you could make them, you could make the maps actually precisely preserve the structure. So you can get these using homotopy theory and uh, uh, the fact that things are free. If, if I know that some map exists in a weak sense, but this thing is free, you can actually get an actual map and get things to commute exactly on the map. So this is a detail of this homotopy theory using the freeness. So you can get this um, tower, uh, and then because of this uh, frank ray duality, uh, it, it took me many years for me to understand this, what the hell is a star? It turns out star is the composition of frank ray duality. So frank ray du star, frank ray duality gives you an isomorphism, an identification between the k forms and the dual of the n minus k forms. These are in duality because you wedge to the top dimension. And so you, would, you can identify this with this. So this is the dual space. This is point ray duality. Then with the uh, metric, you can identify a space to its dual space. So this is a benign thing. It doesn't involve any structure. It's just uh, identifying a dual space to a space. So this composition here is the star. So, Getting the metric to be consistent with everything is, is free. Getting the frank ray duality to be consistent is this non-trivial theorem. It says the frank ray duality can be made to be consistent with this. And the maps in the category, the theorem stronger says the category of such things with frank ray duality is equivalent to the one without frank ray duality in terms of maps and so on. So then you can have all these maps respecting uh, D, wedge, and star, and then the integral is basic topology. Anyways, that's part of the story of building this tower of models. Thank you for letting me know. Other questions? I mean, so 
you're using, you said you're using the freeness of these objects to, yeah. to, to build the to get maps, the maps, to get the maps to make maps, them compatible, yeah. but presumably there's choice involved. Yeah, there's choice. And then, is there a way to get this choice, so maybe you can control some, something like what's energy, the question? Or, energy or something as you make these choices. No, no, what's the question? The question is, as I take the inverse limit, are solutions in this, do they have any kind of meaning in terms of your original oh. vector fields? I mean, well, if there's all these choices so involved, maybe it's just some element of some very wild space with no, no sort of Well, meaning. okay, to answer the first part of your comments, uh, you know, when you're, when you're building maps and so on, you're always solving the equation dx is recursively given, and when you have bases and metrics, you can make that canonical, okay. so high decomposition, so you can actually generate canonical solutions. Okay. Now, regarding the second thing, if you want to go to the inverse limit and get estimates, that's a question somebody asked who wants to prove a theorem. Remember, I said I don't have to prove any theorems. All I want is to make models. And I, my feeling is if, you, if you're doing things conceptually correctly, the models will be meaningful. I haven't done anything that was conceptually incorrect unless I was just made a mistake. But I mean, I'm using the structure of the problem. So this is like simply a point yes question. What's the structure? those things. So we're trying to use the structure to build the model. So these are like non-linear models. So not like the Kalerkin approximation, which is just linear projections. You're using all, all of these things here are the they're like the cumulants in statistics. You know, I mean because I have a statistician here. I mean, this is here's the famous non-equation in mathematics, right? The average of the product is not the product of the average. That's what we're dealing with here. If this, were, if this were equal, all these equations would have been solved long ago. Because you just average out every term, and the things all fit together. So you have to sort of correct that on the nonlinearity. So I, I feel this uh, might work can, can in you the say, sense of being useful. Well, OK. So maybe it works and gives you a coherent picture, and there's no choices in something. It looks like you somehow broke the symmetry by taking cubes. Yeah. Well, you could back. have chosen a different kind of tessellation or something. Do right. you know that what you well, get? Well, this is the nicest one, I think. Well, it's, it's very nice, but right. if you've chosen a different one, do you know that what you get is at least algebraically well, the same? Yeah, right. right. So that, that's the Hobotaki invariances construction. If you chose a different one, you can include them in a common subdivision. It would be a uh -huh. common tower, and it would be maps. Because this is just homotopy. Yeah. This is just the idea that, I mean, the idea of this thing is that the topology we know that if we triangulate the space, once we make everything contractible, we're done. Everything further down doesn't change any of the essential information. So. But for something to be useful, you would, you would want to have the smallest number of pieces and uh, easiest computations you can actually carry out. Sure. Yeah. Is that something suggestive about these kind of... What? You said something suggestive in your abstract and in your picture about there being these attracting uh, sort of scenarios or following measures that you could right. back it. What about this Well, so I'm, what I'm imagining is if, uh, you know, if, if this is faithful enough to the... See, in some sense, people who work at PD, they write the equations, and then they, they're doing algebraic manipulations. They're writing things, they're using standard inequalities, and writing things, and manipulating, and looking for identities and inequalities. And uh, so when you look at the Constantine Foya stuff, they're, they're just using the, these symbols. And then there's certain things they know, it's an L2 and so on. So I would hope that you could carry out it's, it's the same language in finite dimensions. So I would hope you could carry out those estimates, analog to those estimates in finite dimensions, and actually get that there is an attractor. Oh, they prove, I'm sorry, I forgot that you had said yeah, they, they prove it. Perturbations of they, 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 they prove it in dimension 2D, formally, because there are solutions there. And then, assuming there are solutions, enough solutions in 3D, they can prove something. But it's, rel it's relatively elementary. I mean, you have this, uh, I mean, you have this non-trivial, but it's relatively elementary. You have this energy decay by the derivatives, right? So, there's a lot of constants there. I didn't get the structure of the market. 
I want you to do that. And then, and then, um, you know, since the volume is being compressed, it's like these end on maps and stuff. So the volume, you know, and, and what is it? Lorentz uh, took a fluid dynamics equation and projected it into three dimensions and sort of wrote out what he got and got this interesting Lorentz attractor. And then Hanon made uh, a simpler discrete time map, with two variables. And then that has this property that if, you, if the two parameters, if the B parameter is small, then you, you get this squeezing down, area squeezing down, and you go down to something like a one dimensional map, or the folded map. The only first and folded map. Uh, with a lot of universal stuff going on there. So, I mean, dynamical systems is a pretty powerful field, and uh, it's not. You know, it's not as well developed as complex analysis, where the, you know, the theory kind of controls the objects almost. Dynamical systems. We don't know that much, but one knows a lot. A lot of techniques. So as you get to find a dimensional, you can get some stuff. Well, then I hope you can use this. I have a question related to the first one about the different choices that you have. What? I have a question related to the first one about the different choices that you have. So this is like directly an approximation, except that you have these maps from one level. Yeah, that's the whole point. Uh, in in directly approximation, what you usually use for Nariso to show that there are weak solutions. And uh, it seems to me that here, the moment that you have these, these maps, if you, if you use this to get a weak solution, you would have like one limit. Whereas in, in Galaxy approximation, you have to pass through some sequence to get some weak limit. And weak solutions are not known to be unique for the so that's right. an open question. Okay. So you may be related to the different choices that you have here that would, may lead to different weak solutions. Because if you could choose that there is a canonical solution, then you would be solving a, a big open question. Right. Well. Actually, it's kind of a canonical weak solution. Everything the moment, I told you make the tower, the moment 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 you make the tower, what? The moment you make the tower, when yeah. you take the limit, it's yeah. one single weak solution. That's I think it's not unique, tower, it's right? canonical. That's all. <laughs> what? It's not unique, it's canonical. Yeah, I mean. So it yeah. doesn't prove it's unique, yeah. it proves. Well, if everything I said was true, and, and this idea you just said is true, then. say, no, it's not the weak, you don't really get, this is derived from numbers, I'm not, I'm not, I mean, I'm sure there's some argument that says these things are somehow related to that equation, but I'm just deriving it from the equation, it has the same form. What I think is, is the statistics, you can take the inverse of the statistics, when the statistics you can build, you can take the inverse of the tower, yeah. but that's different. Um, See, here I've got all initial conditions. See, you're imagining, so I see, you're imagining take one point of x naught, and look at it, well, see, there's no, there's no real map from that situation to this oh, situation. Okay. We have to sort of, I mean, that's the part I didn't, I didn't explain a lot, the details correspond to there. You have to see if that's map, and then there'd be an orbit here, be an orbit above it, an orbit above it, thought about what this space is at the top of the tower. I'm just thinking of a guy wants to, you know, I'm from Texas, right, so there's this coastline and we've got Cuba and so on. This is where my mother lives. And, and I'm wondering where this thing is going to hit. If it hits, let's see, it's uh, turning like this, right? So if it hits over here, it's throwing a lot of water on this side, and this is something called Harris County here. There was one hurricane coming in that was predicted to come in here that would throw a lot of water here, and uh, they evacuated two million people from Harris County. I flew in the day before, looking out of the airplane, and 
highway, a 12 lane highway is totally full on one side and all the cars are stopped, totally empty on the other side. Because they all ran out of gas and it's hot and kids were crying and everything. It's like a disaster. One bus of old people in oxygen tank got fire and they were all incinerated, stuff like that. And then it turned out, I flew down there and I boarded up my mother's house and so on. It turned out this thing just went, get over here. We didn't even lose electricity. So they didn't have a 48 hour prediction of 50 miles from where this thing was going to hit. You know, with all this money and everything, I was thinking, well, I'm not claiming to have any chance of solving such a problem, but I'm just thinking, how can you improve the model making business a little bit to compute? You take people are flying out in these hurricanes and balloons and stuff getting information. Do you want to stick it into some models? And they have plenty of models. I don't think they know what the parameters are. Well, what they don't, I don't know, actually. There's a place in Colorado we can visit for a while. Anyway, uh, I, I'm thinking, and uh, this is what was answering the question, I'm thinking that the statistics of this is what is going to be useful. Because you can get these things, you can just perform experiments, just like they do in dynamics, just take a bunch of initial conditions, see what happens, and see what happens here. Have some, a lot of data, and you have some statistical information, and then just see what you can use it to predict. Okay, I do huh? but this is very chaotic. Why should this work? Something like this work? If it's by nature a chaotic yeah. system. Yeah, well, um, well, there's supposed to be this uh, chaotic attractor, but everything is supposed to go to this attractor. And also, the problem I mentioned is is where is the center of the hurricane going? It's like a, it's a well-defined thing. Um, well, okay. okay. Uh, I mean, um, there should be equilibrium measures. Yeah, sure, sure. I don't know where it goes, but I'll take it away.